You're very welcome to the Irish Political Roundup with me, Roisin Cleric. And me, Paul Brophy. On the show, uh, we are discussing the up-and-coming Irish referendums, which will be on International Day on the 8th of March in 2024. Irish citizens will be asked to vote on two referendums to change our constitution. The first referendum concerns the concept of family in the constitution. The second referendum proposes to delete an existing part of the constitution and insert new texts providing recognition for care provided by the family members to each other. We have two separate votes on whether we wish to make the proposed changes to the current text of Article 41 of the Constitution, Family Amendment. The Article 41.1.1, the state recognises the family as a natural primary and fundamental unit of society and as a moral in institution processing inalienable and irrespectable rights and uh, antecedent and superior to all positive law. In Article 41.3.1, the, the state pledges itself to guard with special care the institution of marriage on which the family is founded and to protect it against attack. The constitution currently recognises that family unit in society and protects the fa family founded on marriage. The proposal. In this amendment, there will be one vote for two proposed changes. The proposal involves the insertion of an additional text to Article 41.1.1 and the deletion of a text in Article 41.3.1. These proposed changes are shown below. Proposals to the changes. In 41.1, the state recognizes the family, whether founded on marriage or other durable relationships, as the natural primary and fundamental unit group of society, as a moral institution processing inalienable and irrespectable rights ascendant to superior to above law. The, po po the, the proposed changes to Article 41.3.1 one, by deleting text shown through this, uh, the line, the state pledges itself to guard with special care the institution of marriage on which this family is, is founded to protect it against attack. The legal effects of yes and no, if the majority of vote yes, then the constitution will change. The constitution protection of family will be given to both the family based on marriage and the family founded on other durable relationships. The family founded on marriage means that the unit based on marriage between two people without distinction as to their sex. The family founded on durable relationships means a family based on different types of committed and continuing relationships other than marriage. So different types of family units would have the same constitutional rights and protections. The institution of marriage will continue to be recognized as an in institution that the state must guard with special care and protect the attack. So our guests tonight for to talk about and discuss the the, the constitution and the uh, referendum is Deputy P Padar Tobin, founder and leader of the Into Political Part Party. Helen Duggan is a spokeswoman spokeswoman for the Irish Women's Lobby. She is a graduate of Russian and theology, theology in uh, Trinity College, Dublin in 1992 and holds a master's in journalism from DCU in 1996. She lived and worked in Russia in the 1990s before returning to work in Ireland and in the NGO sector and most recently with Am Amnesty International. In 2018, she retained, uh, she, she retained as an interior architect and joined the Irish Women's Lobby in, in 2021. The founders of the Irish Women's Lobby recognised a clear disconnect between the real concerns of Irish women and the public representations of those concerned in the media and the NGO sectors. The Irish Women's Lobby was established as an alternative voice for many women denied political and media representation. The IWL seeks to amplify the voices of women and girls 
impacted by law and practices that are in direct conflict with their rights and interests. And Sabina Devine will be joining us. Sabina is a women's rights, act, women's rights and disabilities activist. Sabina worked with the Dublin Pride in 2013 as an events director and also worked with elderly and served in the country and as a reserve in the Defence Forces Civil Defence. You are all very, very welcome to the Irish Political Roundup tonight. A very topical subject, a Absolutely. very uh, sensitive subject, but again, yeah. also a topic that not very many citizens of Ireland are fully aware of what's happening. And Pater Tolvin, uh, you're the leader of AN2. Um, as as before that, uh, Roisin, she went through it in in a lot of detail. What 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 is proposed? Um, uh, what position will your party be advocating for on the referendum on the eighth of March? Yeah, so we're looking for a no vote uh, in both referendums. Uh, we believe that the constitution is a fundamental legal document. It contains the core rights of citizens, and it also details the responsibilities of the state. It's not a location for what I would call empty virtue signaling uh, by the government. And one of the problems I have with these amendments uh, is I think that they're extremely poorly written. I think the language is confused. Uh, it's unclear. Um, and you know, the legal consequences are potentially far reaching uh, in terms of social welfare, taxation, succession, migration, family law, etc. We simply don't know. Um, and, you know, I, I do believe that it, we should have probably updated the language within the Constitution, that the language it was archaic uh, in, in many ways. But we could have done it without actually deleting uh, core elements of the Constitution. So, you know, I, I would be opposed to the deletion of the word woman uh, from, the, from the Constitution. And um, we've already seen the government try to delete it from legislation, from health care uh, and delete the word woman from wider society. Um, and I think, you know, women have fought so long, so so hard to achieve, you know, their rights within uh, the law and within the Constitution, that the idea that um, the word woman will be deleted from the Constitution, I think, is, is absolutely wrong. And also in terms of care, I just think that, you know, we're, we're living at a time where, you know, um, care has actually never been as devalued as it is at the moment. So we know that childcare is closing at the moment. Nursing homes are, are closing. Children are being put into state care that is unregulated currently by the government. Uh, and this constitutional amendment offers no material benefits to people who are carers or who uh, are in need of care. Um, no enforceable material rights are in this particular um, uh, amendment. In actual fact, I think the government, by this amendment, are insulating themselves from responsibilities uh, towards care uh, as well. And in, in terms of care, I will say, like uh, in my own constituency, I meet mother and fathers who are getting up at six o'clock in the morning, they're dropping their kids off at a creche <clears throat> or a childcare facility at, at seven. They're commuting for an hour and a half. They're doing nine hours work uh, that day. They're, they're, they're doing everything uh, in reverse in the evening time. They, get, they hardly get to spend any time with their children. And, you know, um, they don't have the choice to be able to spend time with their children as they would want to. The government are saying in, 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 in a lot of their preambles around this that a woman's place is wherever she wants it to be. And we fully agree with that sentence. But the truth is, because of the government's policies on rent and on mortgages, for example, you know, people can't be where they want to be because they are actually on an economic treadmill that's forcing them into, you know, uh, such levels of work, such levels of, of commuting hell, uh, et cetera. So, you know, in, in, in these terms, that constitutional amendment that the government are proposing doesn't actually add any rights to them. And in actual fact, actually reduces the rights that the current article within the constitution uh, gives uh, to mothers currently. I would have liked to see potentially, you know, that mothers and fathers uh, are recognized potentially uh, and to make sure that it's uh, more balanced in that regard. And the term durable relationship, um, Padder, that is very, very vague and very, very open to uh, interpretation. If I asked 10 people the same question, I would get 10 different answers. Um, as, as, you, as you mentioned there, earlier on, um, that could have, that term alone um, has wide region co consequences. 
Yeah, no, it, it's incredible. Like on one level, I was thinking that, you know, if you asked an intercert um, or junior cert, I should say, um, showing my age there, a junior cert class um, to write a constitutional amendment and they came back with something like this, you would say, well, fair, fair play, that's not too bad. But, you know, we couldn't obviously put that into the constitution because nobody really knows what it means. And then I'm thinking at the back of my head, well, maybe the government rather that it, they don't, it doesn't know what it means because not defining something gives far more opportunity to make decisions in the future that are unforeseen decisions. And remember, this government don't like to define things. So in the hate speech bill, you know, they wouldn't define what hate meant, meant. they wouldn't define what gender meant, uh, for example. And that's a very dangerous thing. You know, people in a democracy should know what they're voting for. And then that should be put into the, the law. The minister has said that, well, a judge will decide in future what durable means. But that's reverse democracy. That's basically the, the judge deciding uh, what the law is. Um, you know, we've had uh, Mary Baker state, um, she's obviously the, the chairperson of the Referendum Commission, and um, she stated that, um, you know, a durable relationship could be that a person who gets a wedding invite uh, together or gets a Christmas card posted to them together. So, you know, that is a, a situation where um, it's, it's so broad, it's impossible to define what it is, and that can have serious consequences. And actually, where durable relations um, or relationships appears before in the Irish legal system is in a case where uh, Justice Mary Baker was in charge, and, and that was an immigration case. And, and actually, in that case, the context of that was in relation to a, an intimate or a romantic or a sexual relationship. And, you know, the government are actually selling this amendment to say that, you know, actually, you know, a single parents will be now recognized by this. But actually, they may not be recognized by this because under the European Directive and in previous court cases uh, within the system, the, the durable relationship did not mean uh, a family uh, with a, a single parent. And I will say this, so many uh, families headed by uh, a single mother or father who do phenomenal jobs in, in raising um, their children um, and this constitutional amendment does nothing for them. So, you know, I would say the first responsibility for anybody to vote yes in a particular a constitutional amendment will be to know what they're actually voting on. And that's very clearly not the case in this situation. Uh, and, you know, I just can't believe the government has been so useless in terms of of defining what exactly they want to put into the to, to the constitution. And Helen, uh, I spoke from for the Irish Women's Lobby. What is your position and what is it, you know, what are your major concerns about this referendum? Well, the Irish Women's Lobby would echo a lot of what Cutter said there, be calling for a no vote on both amendments. Um, everything that Pater has said, I agree with. That it's a fundamental legal document. The language that's been used is incredibly sloppy. Can't uh, terms cannot be defined by government itself and to, to go before the courts. So that's the first thing. The second um, major objection we have is the removal of the word woman and removal of the word mother. It's the only time it, ap it appears in the constitution at all is 41.2. Women occurs elsewhere in the constitution, but this is a chipping away. And as Padder referred to previous efforts to remove the word woman, we consider very, very dangerous. Um, thirdly, we really, really, really want to stress and can't stress enough that nowhere in the constitution is it said that a woman's place is in the home. This referendum has been called a woman's place in the home referendum is what RT will refer to at all time. It, cementing that idea in people's heads. I've spoken to many, many people who have said they believe the constitution says a woman's place is in the home and it says nothing of the sort. Um, and of course it refers to duties, which is language that people object to. I personally don't object to that. Um, we all have duties. We have duties in the home. We have duties in our workplace. Our right to work, women's right to work, men's right to work, to earn a livelihood is protected under Article 45, equally by men and women. It's patently absurd for the National Women's Council of Ireland and others to say that this article has held women back. It has not held women back. Women have equal access. And legislation deals with access, discrimination, employment law. The, the, this, the Constitution is not the place to tackle if these inequalities exist, they cannot be captured under that article. 
Um, the other major, major problem with this is the care, the provision of care is actually decreased or diminished the recognition of the care that is carried out, whether that be by mothers or any carer. The majority of carers are women. It's about 68%. What I find very interesting is between the census 2016 and census 2022, there was a 50% increase in the number of people who describe themselves as unpaid carers. So okay. they are carers to generally children with disabilities, adult children with disabilities, elderly relatives or other relatives. But there was a 50% increase and it's anticipated that this number is only going to grow for myriad reasons to do with longevity and closing facilities, nursing homes closing down. So care is huge. It's huge. It's not a minority of people. It's going to be even more significant financially, um, it's going to be very, very significant. And as Tom Clonan said on RT Radio this morning, Ireland is the only country in Europe that doesn't have a rights-based based approach to disability. And Ireland has refused very recently to sign the UN Controversial on the Rights of, of the Disabled. Um, and a, again, that's been quite very, Roger Gorman has been very explicit about that. So when this referendum comes along, diminishing the rights of carers, and let's include mothers in that. Um, one has to be very, very wary of signing into constitutional law effectively, a, a, a diminishing of the obligations of the state. And I don't want to go on too long, but I do want to say there's a case that was pending in the Supreme Court uh, regarding a mother seeking not to have a, her carer's allowance means tested for her now adult son with Down syndrome. And the, her first case in the High Court was thrown out, but it has fa been fast tracked past appeals to the Supreme Court. And the three justices involved have said that Article 41.2 has never been tested in relation to carer's allowance. And that that article referring to a mother in the home might well be the article that gives carers back rights to, and takes away the minister's rights to mean test um, allowances. So that could have huge ramifications because that will affect all carers, including mothers or fathers or anyone caring in the home. So that article, one, it protects carers and it protects mothers and potentially needs to be much further tested and the state needs to be pushed on actually fulfilling an obligation to have all sorts of carers not have to leave the home for economic necessity when they're full-time caring for any dependents. So we'll watch that one with interest. It was deferred from October when it was supposed to be heard. And there's a um, there's something called a, a remote case hearing coming up on the 14th of February, but the case itself, it looks like will be post-referendum. Right. Well, also, late. We don't know why it's too late. There's also issues, isn't it, and a lot of ambiguity about the um, child child benefit, because the child benefit was always paid to the mother. Yes. Well, I my understanding of that, and I spoke to um, several legal people on this, a, a child, there have been challenges to um, child benefit in the past, and any attempt to means test child benefit has actually failed. Now, the belief of legal people I've spoken to, it, because children are protected in the constitution, all children will be treated equally. Um, it's felt that any attempt now to use this to downgrade child benefit would not succeed. But what will succeed undoubtedly is that because durable relationships are so open that the person who gets the Christmas card, the Valentine's card or whatever it is, is is in a durable deemed to be in a durable relationship. Well, therefore, if one of that durable relationship is a stay-at-home parent or whatever, is he or she eligible for the tax break, the tax credits, the eye test, the scale and polish, the the PRSI, the the pension benefits? So if if an extra massive percentage of people in durable relationships come looking for their entitlements that married couples have. 
it's impractical, impracticable and unaffordable. What's the state to do? Discriminate against them or pull it, pull those brakes altogether? And that, in the view of many um, senior legal people I spoke to, is a real threat. That is very possible that those tax credits, which, again, a lot of uh, couples rely on, could just be removed altogether. Yeah, well. You know, we talk about, you know, the dis people with disabilities, Clon Clunan was very passionate about on in, in the Senate. And also where he was told to sit down and they, they stopped the, 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 the hearing and then on radio. But Sabina, coming from a, a, as an advocate for disabilities, uh, could you just give us briefly what, what, what your perception of it all is uh, from coming from a disabilities um, background? Well well, I think, you know, like um, I'm a person that has fibromyalgia and I have a, I have ha I have a disability in my leg from a road traffic accident where I've got skin grafts and I still get infections all the time. And also, um, I find it very insulting that it, the National Women's Council are trying to get a yes vote by, you know, throwing disabilities on people with disabilities under the bus. And it, it's just like it's nothing got to do with disability you just want to take out stuff out of the constitution that's got to do with mothers and women who by the way my mother has never been held back by this article she is a self-employed woman who set up a successful business opening a hardware store which you know is totally you know if you want to talk about you know crossing sex boundaries basically because men were always associated with hardware stores and stuff like that and i'm not saying that she never had any difficulties when she did start up but that was got to do with society it wasn't got to do with the law and the other thing that i find is that there was only like the debates uh for for this in the house of Roctus was like looked like it was only two days each and i don't think that's enough time to debate something as fundamental as this in 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 our constitution like and like you know it's um like i also find that you know the likes of rte are being very very biased um when it comes to this barely any time is given to anyone who's campaign on the no side and we know from referendums in the past like the marriage equality and uh, the repeal the eight every one of those people who were on each side were all given opportunities to debate and i know um i haven't seen any public debate being um, um put forward by rte like there normally is and i also find it's very very rushed through and i just think you know like i know they're trying to use the, the thing with lone parent i'm not a lone parent myself but I do understand the difficulties that lone parents have. And I do sympathize with them, especially when they hear hear their kids coming home from school, listening to teachers telling them that they're not families in the constitution, which to be honest, I think that's a load of bull, basically. Um I I I've I've never looked down on any lone parent. I say fair play to them. They're, it's a tough job bringing up a child, even if you're in a in a stable relationship whether you're married or 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 you're in a partnership and i just think you know using people's vulnerabilities uh, to try and get a yes vote is i it, it's just preposterous really you know um so you mentioned it was rushed through there and that's a very key point pada as someone who is in the house of rockers in the doyle you know what is the consensus in the doyle at that it is being rushed through. And also the fact that they're spending 20 million on this referendum in March when we're having local and European elections in May when we could have the, the, the referendum vote in May with the locals and the European elections. Yeah, no, uh, Sabrina makes a, a valid point there because normally in, in, the, in the, the doll, what you have is you have a committee that does pre-legislative uh, scrutiny of a bill to make sure that they, they go through all elements of the bill to make sure it's decent decent stuff. Uh, and they often bring in different um, expertise from outside of, of the Iraq just to try and, you know, tease true elements of the bill. That didn't happen in, in this uh, situation. Obviously, the government ignored the Citizens' Assembly's uh, suggestions. They ignored the uh, Iraq just Committee on Equalities uh, suggestion. It seems to me that they couldn't get a decision together at cabinet 
and they finally went for you know what they thought was bland language that wouldn't necessarily affect change in terms of uh, of rights but what they came up with what on in terms of the family um, amendment is such a confused language that it could have significant effect on people's lives, mm-hmm. uh, but we just don't know what those effects uh, will be uh, as of yet. And, um, you know, as well, I, I want to say, like, you know, in, in terms of the issue of, of women in legislation. So I mentioned uh, earlier, and, and Helen mentioned this as well. This is a systemic effort that the government have been making over the last number of years in relation to the deletion of the word woman uh, throughout legislation. So, you know, we see where the HSC have started to use language such as uh, in, in when they promote cervical check, that they use language of people with the cervix, um, or they say that people who get pregnant. Uh, we, we know that uh, in, in schools now, teachers are being advised to not to use the word mother or father because they say it's not inclusive or not to use uh, the words boys and girls because they say it's, it's not in- inclusive. So this is not an accidental um, process. This is a systemic process that the government has uh, in an effort to change um, you know, the, the structures of society to a certain extent and, and introduce what I would call gender ideology. And a gender ideology which isn't science-based, which is very experimental and which has significant side effects in terms of both the rights of women uh, and development of children. And um, so we know, for example, that the, this government puts two male-born sex offenders into a women's prison uh, in Limerick, uh, for example. And, you know, only because of the rights, uh, the work of, you know, uh, women's rights organizations such as Helen's and the Countess and, and our own, you know, Ain uh, you know, constant questioning of this in, in the doll, they, they have semi-reversed, in other words, but they, they haven't changed the system, but... It's kind of like it's kind of a they're in a no man's land or or, or a, a limbo situation currently uh, with that process. But um, so I think that the government is embarking on a real process of change here. And secondly, I will say this too that you know a mother's relationship with a child is a different relationship um, than a father's uh, relationship. And you know everybody um, you know has been born of a mother, and you know that level of sacrifice and the danger involved in all of that, and that relationship is you know you know is a a a a particular type of relationship that deserves recognition you know these politicians will be at mother's day with their tweeting that their mothers are the most special people in the world and yet in in, 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 and they seek to delete that relationship from the constitution and i I think that's a mistake you know absolutely fathers often uh, make a fantastic impact and there are certain situations that fathers raise their children on their own in a, in a really really positive way, and they should be commended for that. But we should be we should be mature enough as a society to be able to recognise that a mother's relationship with her children and her efforts and her sacrifice is a special one, and it adds a significant benefits to society uh, in relation to that. And I think you know there's there is a, a un, unfortunately I, we we live in a very ideological space at the moment where people are. You know, critical thinking is is been hampered, is being chilled, is being stopped, and you know we need to start to push back against it uh, and be able to say things that you know maybe we feel uh, are not acceptable in, in polite company, uh, etc. But you know, critical thinking is one of the most important elements of a democracy. You know, the competition of ideas are actually one of the most important elements of a, a democracy. Testing you know, uh, ideas from other people is key to proper functioning of a democracy. And, you know, I, I think the government thought they would get away with out much, much pushback on this. But I think they're finding that, you know, there is significant pushback now in relation to this. The polls are interesting. The polls are, are showing less than a majority in favour of both amendments. Still, you know, more than those who are against it, but a big block of about 30% who haven't made up their minds as of yet. So I personally think that this is all to play for still in terms of trying to persuade people. And actually the government might have done themselves a significant disservice because it might have forced people to start to think about all these concepts that many of us have been dealing with for the last number of years. And actually, you know, it might awaken in people that critical thinking which is necessary in a functioning democracy. 
Yeah, um, I, would, I would really support that, if you don't mind me saying, Roisin, just to say, just as it occurs to me there, the idea that a woman's work, if it is indeed the woman's work or the mother's work, is, is somehow demeaning, that has been generally part of the assumption of the culture, but it's not. And we have discussed, we've discovered that very much so just speaking to people as part of this campaign. As one woman said today, she was actually profiled by Senator uh, Crowell, um on Twitter. She said, I've given my life um, 15 years raising my disabled son. Um, I've become a physiotherapist, a speech therapist, a language therapist, everything that she has had to learn to look after a profoundly disabled son. She said to remove that article, that's my only recognition, that, that recognition of the work that I have done. And that's what a lot of women are feeling as mothers. To erase that um, article in the Constitution actually makes it even more, uh, even less recognised that there is value, not just in the raising of children, but in the entire social labour that goes with being at home and part of communities in schools and playgrounds and creches and PTAs and everything else. This is the common good that the constitution originally referred to. And this is not a backward notion. Community is incredibly important. And the idea, quite frankly, of both parents working around the clock whilst children are raised by strangers is dystopian. And we should be moving away from that and doing everything we can to support better communities, better family. Yeah. I think this, this, if I can just briefly just add to that, I think you're, Helen said, right, I think that we live in a society now where the only values are economic output, you know, that nothing else seems to be recognized in terms of, of and actually I would come from the view that the most valuable things are actually the human relationships that we have. That when it all comes to the end of the day, it's the human relationships that we have, it's actually the most important element of who we are as human beings within a society. And I think what's happened, what is part of this is those human relationships uh, in, in terms of care are being devalued further uh, by these uh, uh, constitutional amendments, by an ideology that does not uh, recognize those values at all. I think that's really unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I'm a housewife myself, like, you know, and, you know, like I, when I when I when I first started, like after I graduated from university, like I wasn't really getting anywhere with jobs and stuff like that. But my husband was like, earning a bit of a bit of extra money. So I was able to stay at home. I'm lucky in that sense. But, um, you know, people look down on people like me who have went to university, but are now like looking after the house. But but people don't realize the other jobs that you do, like if you've got pets, you're basically their vet. Um, if you if you are um um you, you have to do a budget, so you're basically an accountant. Um and because I grew up in a hardware store, I know how to fix things when they get broken. So pretty much I could be an engineer if I wanted to be, <laughs> you know. And also, you know, you have to make sure that there's food in the house and things like that. So there's whole loads of logistics around this. And people always think when you're a housewife, you're automatically a kid change the kitchen sink and that is not always the case you know it's just like like you know people again and the other thing that annoys me is that women in power are pushing for this you know these are women who have like been educated and they're in high prominent privileged positions in our government and 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 in 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 NGO organizations and things like that, and they're really really pushing hard for this and telling us lay women that we are, you know, we're being oppressed by this constitutional article, which is actually not the case at all. Like so, that's my opinion on it anyway. So, yeah, there's a constant reference to Archbishop McQuaid and De Valera, you know, um, but in fact, I think it was Professor Jeffrey Shannon is the rapporteur on child protection for the government. He said that the Irish constitution is absolutely unique in its protection of families in terms of longevity of protection of the, the homemaker basically mm -hmm. is protected, and it's normally a woman, um, for the duration of her life in the case of marital breakdown. And we're, we're absolutely unique in that as well. Um, so a lot of these women calling for the deletion of this article as if it's against the interests of women have it upside down. This article is totally and utterly in support of women um, and in their protection. 
Yeah. And th there's another brief point there. The um, the government actually promised in the programme for government to bring about a constitutional amendment to support the right to a home. That oh, obviously never that obviously never happened, and it's not going to happen now by the looks of things. But in this amendment, they're actually deleting one of the few references to a home. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, I, I think there's no doubt in my mind um, that this go these amendments are not built to um, strengthen rights, to provide material benefits to people and to give, you know, rights uh, to individuals. And what we're seeing here is an attack on many rights in, in truth. And, you know, Judge Susan Denham made, made that point very, very clearly uh, that she said that this these this particular amendment in the family does not uh, exclude women and mothers uh, from their roles, um, but actually provides uh, a recognition of that significant role and uh, that's played by many and actually supports that as well. Uh, and I think it'll be retrograde to uh, to get that out of the constitution. Mm -hmm. It's the, I've been referring to it as the referendum of unintended consequences, which are vast. They are vast and not just in, in relation to terms such as durable relationships. If, if, if those, in the absence of any definitions, we cannot, cannot anticipate what will happen if even the simple deletion of a word like mother happens when we're facing into all sorts of laws and new laws and new legislation regarding issues like surrogacy. How is baby trafficking going to be affected if we weaken these protections of family, motherhood, childhood, etc., in the constitution. And I feel that blowing it all away will open us up to a host of issues with regard to things like surrogacy. I'm worried about that myself, the surrogacy. I think it is. It's, and it's baby trafficking. You've also got uh, womb trafficking and it's, it's a conveyor belt, a baby fat. And, and then you, it's just really, really... It goes into that dark, deep set of the human trafficking and uh, women trafficking and women's for sale. And the thing with the surrogacy is to mother that mother baby bond before the baby's even born. Um, it, it, that's so unique. Mm -hmm. That that's for another program, but and, and we'll talk about that in another program. We have two minutes left before Pada had to hop off to uh, prime time tonight. So, pa so Pada, maybe if you could give us, um, maybe we'll all go through three of you very quickly. What would be your last word to the voters from your perspective about the referendum? I would say to voters, um, take your time to research these amendments. I think it would be in the government's interest. Uh, if there's apathy, if people don't bother with this referendum, if they ignore this referendum. Um, and, you know, I think low turnout would probably suit the government in, in terms of this. So first of all, engage with this um, and then look at look at the issues. Look at very clearly uh, in relation to do you understand what a durable relationship is? Can you find anybody in government who can tell you what a durable relationship is? And if nobody seems to know what a durable relationship is, then how can you in good conscience vote for that inclusion uh, into the constitution? And the second issue uh, there is the issue of care. Care is an extremely important aspect uh, of uh, our society. And, you know, there are uh, at least a half a million people involved in care on a daily basis in the state, and they are entitled to rights and um, they are entitled to supports. This uh, care amendment does nothing uh, for those, it actually insulates the government against having to be responsible to provide supports for these individuals. Um, it is a very watered down version of what is in existence currently. Um, and, you know, I would ask people to to uh, to vote against that amendment as well. And Helen, what would, from the Irish Women's Lobby, what would you, your last word? Be? I would say, I would ask people just to, uh, to ask questions. Why has this been sought? What are the outcomes? Look at the claims being made by the Yes, uh, the yes Lobby. They're, they're very shallow claims of what this is going to actually mean for the real live daily lives of carers, mothers and families. So I'd say, ask question, what is it going to achieve? Why now? Why has it been pushed? Why was there no pre-legislative legislative scrutiny? Why are the recommendations of the Citizens Assembly and the Oireachtas Committee being ignored? 
Uh, why did the Shannon have two days to turn around? Why these there are so many questions apart from the definitions. There's there's I can't think for anyone looking in and asking these questions, is there any one good reason to vote yes? And I cannot see one. No. And it, it's, it's the fact that it's rushed through the very, very ambiguous wording and there's no debating at the moment. There's a lot of censorship on the mainstream media. I mean, there's just so many questions and the cancelling of women. Um, Sabina, what would be very quickly your last um, your last uh, words to the voters from your perspective? Well, I, I agree with what Helen is saying. Um, 100%. Um, also, um, if those people are in the don't know category and they still don't know on voting day, I'm going to use the phrase that my father uses, if you don't know, vote no. So that's that's my think, my my um, opinion on it anyway. Helen, just before we go to you, you had a very successful uh, silence protest outside the Mansion House in Dublin, which is very successful at the launch of the uh, National Women's Council's yes, uh, launch of their yes campaign. Mm. Very successful on your part. Tell us briefly about that. Well, um, the Silence Protest is an umbrella organisation for several women's groups right. to unite together on particular issues. So we came together on the first issue was to remove um, men from women's prisons. So two sex offenders have been housed with women in Limerick prison. And we have very successfully brought attention to that. Um, and with the result that parliamentary questions have been asked and a result is now pending, but there has been significant pushback in the door. The second um the second reason the silenced protest came together again this group of women is to fight this referendum um, and we had our launch of our vote no campaign on the same day as the national women's council of ireland had their vote yes campaign in the mansion house publicly funded uh, the national women's council is funded is 85 percent government funded so it's launched the referenda and it's strictly against referendum rules that government lobbies and pays to secure a, a specific outcome. So this is clearly in contravention of the rules to use a government funded organization. So the women who are concerned about the outcome and the effect on women's rights and children's rights were actually on the street outside the, uh, the mansion house. And we think this spoke volumes. Um, and the, the fair representation is not happening in the media um, it's not happening anywhere for the no campaign. So this is a very, very, very one-sided debate that we have never seen before in a referendum where the yes and no are not being equally represented and there's three or four weeks to go. Quite worrying. So we will be stepping up our campaign and we'll be looking for um, that support from media and from government. Yeah. And Paul. And Helen, just as a kind of, a slight little aside, but it's still very, very important. It, like the debates that we're having, um, we have hate speech legislation that's potentially that is coming coming down the tracks. You know, if that is passed, you know, um, conversations like this could be potentially shut down, which would be you know fundamentally wrong. Um, sure, surely, if we if something like this does does come into play, it's voices like yours are going to be are going to be censors and that that's that's not right yes and i'm i have no doubts i've no doubts that voices like like ours will be censored absolutely no doubts we've seen it we've seen it in countries where hate speech laws have not even been enacted yet but they've been enacted in the spirit of the of the appending uh, law has been adopted in the uk we see police um, arresting, um, well, obviously arresting protesters, arresting women who are praying on the side of the street, arresting women for social media pro posts which say men cannot be women or no men in women's sports, things like that. We've seen, so even with the, where the hate, we have hate crime laws, but there's specific hate speech laws not yet in place, but the, there's a chilling effect in place already where people are frightened to speak up. They see what's happening in, in other countries, Canada, Australia, the US. We've seen um, just this week, 
a Newcastle United FC supporter has been suspended as a supporter uh, for expressing gender critical. That means she doesn't believe men can be women. Um, and she's expressed that on media and she's been suspended by a football club. So the Premier League actually has an espionage unit and it's, it, 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 is, it reserves the right to censor its own fans for their political beliefs. So we don't need hate speech laws to be enacted. They're in effect already. I got letters from Jennifer McNeil, O'Connell McNeil, sorry, I mix up her name, um, various, various ministers saying, I said, can I stand outside the Doyle and say no males in women's jails? Can I stand outside the Doyle with a sign that says women don't have penises? They have re replied to me and said they're confident that the hate speech bills would not prevent me from doing that. But there is no way they can make those claims at all. So Michael McDool, former attorney general, one of the most senior legal line, minds in the country, says this language cannot safeguard against you and your freedom of expression at all. But TDs have no problem putting it in writing and writing letters. I'm confident that you'll be able to do that. No, we won't. We won't be able to do that. And we won't be able to do this. Well. Wow. I actually met with Catherine Murphy about the hate speech laws. She's um and um, she was saying it's up to the uh, DPP whether to prosecute. And I was just like, but if people overhear a conversation in the pub and people are having the crack, as as mm. we all do in Ireland, and we're slagging off each other and various different things, and people. I said, does that mean that like we say a joke and someone overhears and it gets offended by it? And I'm so sick of people being offended about stuff. It's just ridiculous. Like get it, get a life. But anyway, like she was saying it was up to the, the DPP to prosecute and go forward. And I was just there going, so does this mean because what's written here in the law, like it's up to the DPP. So he might prosecute some cases, but he mightn't prosecute your case. So what, like, it just seems a bit haphazardy if, if you ask me, you know? Well, it's designed for that chilling effect because nobody wants to be that case that is prosecuted by the DPP. So it just has a general chilling effect and, and criticism stops dead. Yeah. Yeah. I, I suppose the fact that in the legislation, it doesn't define actually what hate yes. uh, is, that really just opens so many doors that could be, you know, could have a lot of negative consequences. Yeah. And I wish to start using sex instead of gender, you know. <laughs> gender is a social construct made up by people, you know. It's like well, again, I think stick yeah. with the biological terms, which is sex, male, female, you know. It may be uh, there there are issues there in this referendum that may be linked. Um it's only conjecture, but the GRA 2015 Gender Recognition Act uses sex and gender interchangeably, which really makes a nonsense of the law mm. itself. Um, a male it can, will, will become the sex of a woman um, and sex is immutable, but they managed to pass a law using those two terms interchangeably, which is extraordinary. So I, I, I feel that there, that there could be a link um, once words like mother and woman are taken out of the constitution, that might be a further weakening or a further cementing of those interchangeability of those terms elsewhere in legislation. And even the term violence against women has now gone gender-based violence. So yes. Yeah. That, and that is very dangerous too, because women are not going to report violence, a domestic violence case, if it becomes a gender-based violence. You know, they're even taking that away from women, women who are living with domestic violence, domestic abuse or rape, the gender-based violence. I mean, it takes it that away from women and it makes it very vague, gender-based violence. You know, there can be violence against men, but that is, you know, male violence against men or male violence. And then you have the violence against women. And I think there's only one... Uh, TD or she's an MEP now that is only saying who's still using the word violence against women. That's Frances Fitzgerald, and I just tweeted. Uh, she was on Instagram, and I just said last night, "Thank you for for using the still using the terms violence against women," because 
that is, you know, I think that's very dangerous to take that away when women are being violated in their own homes, need help, and it's being turned around again to taking away the woman out of the violence. It's being neutered. It's being neutered. Quite yeah. mm -hmm. taking, Actually, taking it away, like taking mothering away from women as well. It's divesting uh, meaning from the word woman and divesting me uh, divesting and pulling asunder words that go together such as mothers are women women are mothers and, and pulling those asunder which which will render everything a little bit meaningless and everything open to interpretation through a gender lens yeah but it's all also been indoctrinated in universities and stuff i remember my final year in university it was and i graduated in 2018 in minute and i just remember everything was like this was the first time I heard the word cis, right? And I'm like, oh, and then I hear gender-based violence. And I was just like, well, what the hell is that like? You know, it's like, you know, I thought it was more violence against women that people would discuss, especially like some women's age used to do. But um, they, they seem to have, have gone as well. Like, um, but it's, um, yeah, it's, it, it's coming from the universities as well, like, you know, and people yeah. say to me, would you not go back and do a master's and go, why would I want to go back to that? I said it was getting really woke. I could, I could hate to see what it's like today, you know, especially since I've seen some tweets from some professors in the sociology department. I'm like, what? Like, honestly, like, you know, wanting to silence gripped media. <laughs> yes <laughs> like you shouldn't want to silence any media regardless of their own biases and stuff like that and i also think media shouldn't be held behind um especially when it comes to articles about the referendum they shouldn't have those articles behind a paywall yeah. i think they should be they should be free to the public to actually read them you know um and because it is important information regardless of where what what side they're they're talking about because I've noticed that a lot of the, uh, especially the yes campaign ones, they're all behind a paywall. So I'm like, I want to find out what they're saying as well as what the no side are saying. But um, I'm still voting no because I'm still not convinced for the yes. So there you go. That is actually <laughs> a, a very good point point you make that, you know, during referendums that um, articles be either yes, for or against, you know, they shouldn't be behind a paywall. They, everyone should have all access to all information and be able to make a fair and and an informed decision. So, I think yeah, that's really, and, yeah, I really, also really people, interesting. Also, people I've been talking to, they don't even have the booklet um yet being posted out, and because a lot of people are like, "Well, what's this referendum about?" and I was talking to two separate taxi drivers, and and they didn't even know about the referendum, and. And and I'm just like and and even my own father at the big when the when the S campaign was starting to get the ball rolling, I he didn't even know about the referendum and he watches the news all the time on RTE. And unfortunately, that's where he gets his news from. Like, but you know, like he's not really into going onto computers or going online. So, but he didn't even know there was a referendum coming up. And he's a very very political person. Like you know so. And Helen, where do you see this going within the next month when there's so much with the new experience within the media, within politicians, and even with referendums before you see people canvassing at the door, we're voting. I know Paul and I were part of, when we were both members of the Labour Party, we used to be out canvassing. So it's, yeah. as they doesn't see, as Padre said, you know. There doesn't seem to be much interest from politicians, but they're all pushing it. And the media are censoring, you know, interviewing people on the radio, but not putting the interview up on their website or on SoundCloud. So where is this going to go in the next months? I honestly, I just do not know. I do not know. I'm. I know from previous campaigns that the marketing and promotion would have started well by now. Um, there isn't even a, a big online campaign coming from the government. So I. I and I agree with everything Sabi was saying there about censorship of the. There's a lot of censorship of the no side going on. I see quite a bit of 
yes, campaigning in the media, in the Irish Times, uh, etc. But it's still very low key and targeting a very specific kind of audience. So Padder is saying that a low turnout would suit government. Um, I guess that's the way, that's the route they're taking, that they mobilize enough of the kind of NGO sector. Uh, Roger Gorman, as you know, threatened the NGO sector who didn't progressive NGOs that were not going to come out in support, again, in complete controversial, contravention of the rules. Um, and they have come out in force, uh, all the NGOs. So is it going to be a kind of a public sector vote? Mm-hmm with a, a very um, a very low turnout, um, suppress the no side. But I think that with, with the polls now showing such a large, I mean, it's really f- reflected in the 30% plus who are undecided. They're undecided because of the lack of information. Um, I think that the way for us to proceed on the no side is, is, the, grass, is the grassroots, is the grassroots getting the word out. It, the mechanism such as this, um meetings podcasts um social media um and that's what we have at our disposal and we have to reach that cohort that are um impervious to the to the government line i remember when i was uh, doing my media um degree and i was studying women in women in uh arab women in the media and that that's what it said that it's the arab spring and the Arab women use the social media and that the power of social media is equally as powerful, if not more, than the mainstream media. Mm-hmm. And it's been said many, many times that, you know, through various reasons, journalists are either being silenced, they're not allowed, editors are, are, are censoring what they want to write, but citizen journalism is really coming to the forefront now people actually going on their phones, on their phones, and actually reporting what is happening, just mm-hmm. like the, the silenced protest up, up in Dublin outside the mansion house, the people were on the phone, they were they were tweeting about it, they were doing videos, and then members of the public were saying, what's going on over there? Mm-hmm. You know, so... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's different. And, and maybe we could say it's different. I mean, is it different to repeal in that sense that social media was a massive factor? But this is that's a different, uh, it's very different when the majority is on, on one yeah. side, um, unlike this. So it's very, it's very, very hard to call. I thought when the Shannon uh, had to return its um, findings by, it was Tuesday, I think it was Tuesday, the 7th of February. Was that the 7th? It was a Tuesday anyway. February. And the belief then was that there was from Wednesday, the government was going to launch their campaign from Wednesday and they would have a, a clear run to March the 8th. But it just didn't happen. And the, the NWCI launch was was low key and poorly, poorly attended. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I think we, we may have got we got as much media coverage, really. Um, and just the numbers, I reckoned a kind of a rough headcount. I thought there were possibly a hundred people at that launch, which is very, very small numbers. Um, Labour Party were present, but I didn't see any other anyone from Sinn Fein, anyone from Fianna Fáil, anyone from Fianna No one there. So a very, very low profile. So I, I'm, I'm flummoxed really. And. I know this is going to be, you don't have to answer ladies if you don't think so. Do you think it's the NWCBI, NCBI, National Women's Council of Ireland, has it now got conflict of interest? Is it now, you know, is there an issue with where they're not who they are, who they say they are on the tin? They're not representing the women of Ireland, they're representing um, the girls and the government. And whoever's paying, whoever funding them. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's the case with all NGOs, really, isn't it? I mean, they're it's they're completely misnamed. They're not in. They're not non-governmental organisations. They're governmental organisations as long as the majority of their income is is from government. government, of course. So, I mean, the Irish Women's Lobby was established directly in in to counter the fact that the National Women's Council of Ireland is not representing a huge amount of women. And that started off as the women who don't believe men can be women and wouldn't put a man on, on their board saying he's a woman. Yeah. And so even on that alone, where they are not representing probably most women in Ireland. 
Yeah, um, actually, I've seen a Gripped Media. Um, it just been released there today. Um, and it it's called an in depth look into the funding of Ireland's largest NC um NGO, which is about the National Women's Council, and they have an in depth look of the the costs and um. They get funding from the HSC and apparently um, 96% of um, the NCWI staffing costs have been paid by paid for directly by grants from the government and HSE departments. That's just one quote. But they, read the article. It's just like, like, you know, they are funded by the government and they keep saying that there were a non, non-government organisation. But when they're paying over 90 percent of the bill for their for for their staff it it, i'm just like so what like you are part of the government (laughs) yeah all all, all their pay scales are linked linked to the public service as well i mean thirty three thousand ngos yeah thirty three thousand ngos delivering what government wants yes Mm. They're certainly getting their message out there. The government are certainly getting their message out there through NGOs or delivering the message, influencing through their messaging to the general public exactly what the government wants them to do. There's something else I should add, um, and that is a lot of the funding of NGOs, especially larger NGOs such as Amnesty International, come from uh, philanthropic organisations often the US, um, the One Foundation, huge amounts of funding go, goes into Amnesty International and it's on the back of campaigns that those organisations want it to run. So we have government and international organisations and as Padre Jobin will, will often say, 70% of our legislation is supranational. So in effect, our, our national government is acting like a local county council, really, in that it's enacting a small minority of laws. Most things are coming from abroad. So with the National Women's Council, as Sabi said, 85% or 96% of staff costs coming from government. Um, all of these NGOs then will have further funding from groups that are ideological, and when, when Amnesty International switched away completely from defending p- political prisoners, prisoners of conscience, onto issues, uh, social issues, abortion, um, equal marriage, uh, sex workers, and in inverted commas, prostitution rights, uh, these are all dictated from these foundations that are paying it. Who pays the piper, plays the tune, etc. So it's 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 in all very, very, very undemocratic. It's very, very yeah. undemocratic. Well, maybe we should do a program on the funding and the NGOs, especially when there's 33,000 NGOs here in Ireland. And um, we're just a little small island of what, yeah. five to 6,000 uh, million people? Five to 6 million people? Is that including yeah, the yeah. North as well? Am I, am I oh, showing yeah. my very bias there? <laughs> well, if you were if to put it in comparison, Ireland is. The whole island of Ireland um, is about the same size population wise as Greater Manchester. Yeah. And we got thirty three thousand, and there's something wrong there. And you know, it's and there's a lot of taxpayer money going that that direction. Well, we've come to a close. We really, really would love love to thank you both, Helen Diagman, uh, Sabina Devine, and Padre Chobin for coming on today. You know, there's a lot more programs that could come out of this one program itself. But we really do thank you for taking the time of your busy day to come and talk to the Irish Political Roundup today. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Indeed. Thank you very much. Thanks ever so much. It's been really, really um educational. Certainly, <laughs> um before for tonight's program, I wasn't a hundred percent sure on what the referendum was, what it was covered, and it's been really, really um an eye opener, and I and I and I really appreciate that uh, you taking the time to talk to us here on, on the program. It's been ma- a massive help to me. Great. Thank you for having us. Thank you. And Paul, if we can have a little joke here. You and I have known one another since 2011. We're in the yeah. Labour Party right. together. We're in the, we're in the media yeah. together. We're doing this together. We could say we're a durable relationship, and I'm, I'm afraid your girlfriend won't like that, but you know what? <laughs> I know she was. <laughs> we might have to edit this bit now. <laughs> <laughs> oh.